Um, I was wondering if you saw my screen as I see it, or if you see only the 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 banner, the flyer. I think you see the flyer. Yeah, you see the flyer. Yeah, yeah. Yes. the flyer only. That's great. So in a couple of minutes we'll be going on online. Right, then we are online only with the uh, with the the flyer, the waiting flyer, the waiting panel. And in two minutes we're going online. All right, then one minute to go. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay. Yep. So now we're good? Yes, you're online. Okay, great. So um, welcome everyone to this panel discussion on research communication. I'm Constanza Rojas Molina, mathematician and science communicator at CY Sergi Paris University. Uh, our event is organized as part of the Utopia Science Fair that is running um, right at this moment and until May 15, and is organized by Utopia. Uh, this is an alliance of six European universities that are working together, um, uh, collaborating, uh, having students exchange, staff exchange, and uh, trying to answer the question, well, how does the future of European universities look like? And uh, this alliance includes, as I said, six universities, the Vraie Université Brussels, CY Sergi Paris Université, University of Gothenburg, the University of Ljubljana, the um, Pompeu Fabra University Barcelona, and the University of Warwick. Uh, so we have taken, a, taken the opportunity that this a science fair is taking place, where you can see uh, some of the research carried out in these six universities to invite representatives of each of these universities to discuss on what is the role of the universities and us as communicators and researchers in these times where there is so much information and knowledge being created. Uh, that's, this is why we, uh, our era is called the information age. And together with these huge loads of information, we are also having um, a lot of misinformation and, um, and this misinformation phenomenon like um, fake news or the anti-vaxxers or anti-mask movements are having a huge impact in our society. So the question that brings us together today is um, what is our role in this context uh, as um, universities and uh, researchers and communicators? So uh, for that, we welcome today um, 
members of each one of these universities that I would like to um, invite to introduce on the first uh, round. So let us start with, um, with Sarah Pardon. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Sarah Pardon, and I'm here with my colleague, Sarah Luridan. Uh, we represent the Science Outreach Office of VUB. Now, we understand that we share the same name, so that may be a bit uh, awkward or inconvenient. Um, so if you address us, you can always uh, say the VUB team, for instance. Um, but what do we do? Uh, we communicate about science. Um, we run a number of projects where we help researchers to engage with uh, the general public. Uh, and throughout this process, we offer guidance, support and training. So just to give a few examples of what we do, uh, we have a comedy night, for instance, or we organize science bars, or we help with uh, the writing process of popular scientific uh, blog posts, for instance. Um, we find that by engaging with general public and communicating about science, we find that this can be rewarding and empowering for researchers. Um, so as VUB, we also value being part, of course, of being Utopia, uh, where we also center on, on student empowerment and uh, doing that over uh, different cultures and contexts. Uh, so very happy to be here. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so happy to have you here. And um, now we could go to Matthias. Hello, <clears throat> my name is uh, Matthias Lindgren Sandgren and I work at the University of Gothenburg, uh, situated in the city of Gothenburg in West Sweden, right about the coast. Uh, the University of Gothenburg is a multidisciplinary university <clears throat> and we have about 49,000 students and uh, about 6,000 staff. Uh, and I have been at the university for about 11 years. <clears throat> right now I'm working at the Grants and Innovation Office, but I have had different roles during my time here and I used to be <clears throat> the head of uh, or the webmaster and social media guy at the uh, communication unit at the university before. Uh, and I still work as the communicator for something called the Wallenberg Center of Molecular and Translational Medicine. So that's pretty much my closest tie to research communication or science communication right now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, then we can move to Luisa. Okay, hi everyone, pleased to be here. I am Luisa Barbosa Gomez. I represent the University Pompeu Fabra, Barcelona, uh, which is a public institution that was founded in the 1990s uh, and has a strong compromise with the biggest multidisciplinary challenges of our century. Um, I work specifically inside the university for a study center uh, on science, communication and society. Uh, and in the center, we focus on bringing closer together science and society. Um, and we do so by giving training, by uh, analyzing the relationship between scientists and civil society. Um, and of course, by organizing uh, initiatives or events on science communication, outreach and public engagement. Uh, my personal interest is in public engagement, participatory activities, citizen science and open science. And this is what uh, I've been working for the last four years now um, inside a couple of uh, projects funded by the European Commission that uh, maybe I'll have the chance to discuss later. Thank you. Great, we're looking forward, Luisa. Thank you. So maybe we can move now to Julian. Okay, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Julian Longhi. I'm full professor at uh, Siwai Sergi Pari University, which is a multidisciplinary, dynamic, uh, fairly young and uh, ambitious uh, university located uh, northwest of Paris. Uh, and spe I specialized in uh, discourse analysis and digital humanities. Uh, I'm the director of the Institute of the Digital Humanities and the uh, deputy director of the Institute of Technology in charge of research and communication. And I'm very involved in uh, open science and uh, scientific communication issues as a teacher, as a researcher, and in connection with my institutional re responsibility. Now, so I'm very happy to, to be here. So thank you, Julien. Thank you for being here today. And now 
um, uh, perhaps we move. I'm, I'm going, by the way, I'm going uh, without any order. I'm just following the Zoom, <laughs> the Zoom distribution that I have. Um, so let's go now with Tanya. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tanya Dmitrovich. Uh, I'm uh, vice rector at uh, the University uh, of Ljubljana in Slovenia. Um, I oversee the field of knowledge transfer. Uh, we have um, a knowledge transfer office, uh, which is also tasked um, partly at least with communicating uh, scientific achievements um, of our researchers. Um, university of Ljubljana is the largest university in Slovenia, which is not such a big feat, um, having only a few uh, a handful of universities in Slovenia. Um, we are a public university. Uh, we celebrated 100th anniversary um, now two years ago. Um, it's uh, also a comprehensive university, which means uh, that we actually include basically all uh, disciplines of um, science, uh, arts, and humanities, which offers great opportunities also for interdisciplinary work. Um, and uh, we are, of course, um, trying to do our best uh, in communicating uh, science, what we do, and representing science also in Slovenian uh, sphere, um, which now I think we have uh, had many opportunities uh, in this past year as our researchers um, are actually leading experts in all uh, COVID-related issues. We run uh, testing and so on on the national level. So we have been present uh, with these teams a lot uh, in recent years. So thank you, Tari. Uh, de definitely these this pandemic times are, are particular, they, they have showed um, how um, important and delicate is this issue of, of communicating and communicating research, especially now with the COVID situation. So uh, perhaps now we can go to Jane. Jane from the- Hello. <clears throat> Hi there. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm Jane Cummins. I work at the University of Warwick as a research communications manager. So um, a lot of what I do involves taking um, quite academic and um, abstract um, research and translating it to a non-academic audience, whether that be um, more of a sort of public audience, um, internal audience is also um, a key um, target audience of ours. Um, and then we have funders, policymakers, um, and government, um, and um, as well as a student perspective academic audience. So it's really about tailoring the communications to those groups. Um, there's also been quite a lot of work that I've been doing around research impact. So demonstrating the tangible benefits, societal benefits to a non-academic audience um, and how the research is impacting the world outside of academia um, and, and sort of the global reach and significance of the research as well. So it's, it's quite a broad role and it's also encompassed in recent months quite a lot of um, COVID-19 research to um, demonstrate the, the, the research function is very much engaged with the pandemic, offering expert um, in, uh, insight um, and also uh, sort of detailing the research that's been done in response to the pandemic. So yeah, what I do is quite broad. It goes across the institution. I'm not aligned to a particular department or faculty, but I work closely with colleagues from the different faculties, as well as um, obviously colleagues within different departments in professional services, such as marketing communications um, and the international office as well. So thank you very much for having me today. We are not listening. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. I just realized that I was muted. So thanks a lot, Jane. Um, uh, so uh, fr from your presentation, I see that you have to work with, uh, with researchers. And I have one question about that for you. Um, is it easy to work with researchers? Um, it, it varies really, but yes, generally speaking, um, once you've explained to them the um, sort of remit, the audience and most importantly, I think the benefits of, of communicating their research, then it is quite a straightforward and, and linear process. Um, from what I've found, 
Um, it's getting their sort of buy-in and support for the process of, of undertaking the comms, as well as citing examples of successful communications as well um, mm -hmm. that have you know, be, been done in other areas of the academy for other researchers. So it's really about almost selling the idea into them and um, working collaboratively with them as well so that you fully understand what it is that they're doing um well in, in a lay um way really rather than in in too much detail but it, it's getting that understanding of the aims and the potential impact of their work um and them understanding what you're trying to achieve through the communications that, that really makes for a um a successful collaborative partnership thank you uh, maybe we'll get back to this uh, later um, so then uh, let us start with, well, the most uh, basic thing of why, why we do uh, communication. Um, what is the importance of research communication and public engagement today as compared to the past in, in all these the disciplines that we are representing? And, um, and is it, is it uh, important? So, and, and by this, I, I'm pointing at, um, is it really necessary? And uh, perhaps we can, uh, we can start with um, Sarah, uh, the, the VUB team. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, it's a, it's a really good uh, a question. I think there is a, a growing awareness of what scientific communication can be and, and what outreach can be. And I think there's a steady progress there. Uh, for me, the question actually brought to mind this philosophical um, thought experiment that you sometimes hear, you know, when a tree falls and if no one sees it, did the tree actually fall? Uh, and I think you can relate this to this question as well um, without going too far into that philosophical debate. But uh, I think the tree definitely falls or, or to relate it to this question, the research is definitely done, properly done so. Uh, but what we try to do as a science outreach office is help to, to spread the noise of the fallen tree, so to speak. Um, but as far as the differences between now and the past is concerned, I'm going to give the floor to my uh, colleague, Sarah, to uh, she has a bit more of a broad perspective there uh, to say a few words about that. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, so I am the second Sarah of the University of Brussels. Um, and concerning those changes that we've seen um, over the past few years, I wanted to highlight three areas where we've seen that change. Um, first of all, in funding. So more and more, we've seen that science outreach is becoming a part of funding applications. Um, that's certainly the case for, for example, the Flanders Research Foundation. That's one of the bigger funding institutions in Belgium. Um, and actually, this is the first year that we're getting requests from young people, young researchers, if it's possible to still participate in a science outreach project before their funding deadline. So that's very interesting uh, to us. It hasn't happened before. Um, and that's a huge shift. Um, it also means that for the first time, researchers really have an incentive to do outreach and to communicate about their expertise. Um, it makes our jobs a little bit easier. And of course, uh, the public benefits as well, uh, but that's a different story. Um, secondly, I think the interpretation or the concept of what research communication or public engagement is, has changed. Um, it's less of a one-way direction where a scientist explains a certain fact or certain results to the public, so more of a schooling kind of way. Um, that hasn't gone away, it still has its rightful place, um, but now we see more interactive projects where there's more of a dialogue uh, created between the scientists and the public, or for example, citizen science projects, uh, where citizens actively take part in research and gather data and so on. So it's not only about getting research results to the general public. Uh, we've seen there's more room and also more interest in tailoring research and tailoring even educational efforts within the university to society. Um, to give you an, an example, we have a project that is called Wetenschapswinkel. Uh, it means science shop. And there we work together with civil society organizations and NGOs here in Brussels and beyond. Um, and we're collecting hundreds of possible research topics from them. So that means real questions, real research needs 
in our own communities that can be answered in the thesis or another research project. Um, and then the last point I wanted to highlight, um, we feel that there's more attention for the process of what science is. So what I mean by that is the fact that science is not dogmatic um, and there are often opposing views. So I personally think that's a really important aspect of science to communicate and maybe we still uh, have to put more emphasis on that. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot, uh, Sarah and Sarah. Um, so maybe now we can move to um, Tanya. Uh, Tanya, what is your view or your experience uh, on this, on what is the importance and is it necessary nowadays? Well, I can speak uh, here also as a researcher. I come from the field of marketing, uh, which uh, uh, is by nature uh, of the discipline, uh, trying to tell people uh, what um, is uh, good for them, what is helpful, how to improve their lives uh, overall. But uh, when I find myself uh, in a role of researcher, um, uh, of course, we have to do the research, we like to do the research uh, in order to progress through our academic careers. And as uh, you just said uh, before, it's quite often it happens that you are so uh, entrenched uh, into this um, scientific publication criteria and processes that uh, one tends to forget uh, also about the, let's say, wider audience. But um, as Sarah uh, just said, I think this is, um, th there is an increased awareness also in, uh, among the researchers uh, of all ranks, basically, that we need to tell people what we do in order to show them that we provide value, to provide value for, to society uh, at large and to provide value to individuals um, and also to, of course, businesses and, you know, the, um, uh, let's say, the economic sphere uh, in the society. We as public university um, uh, are faced with this uh, also uh, from the perspective of being publicly funded. So um, as we know nowadays, uh, political discourse sometimes runs in a very strange directions. I'm sure we all experience it in our countries. Uh, and it's very easy uh, to get out uh, very populistic views uh, in terms of, you know, these people are just spending our money, the, the taxpayers earned uh, uh, with, you know, in, with their sweat uh, and hands and, uh, you know, working really hard. Uh, so we have to show them, you know, that we are not spending money, they are investing in us because we can then uh, foster progress of society and also impact individuals' lives. Um, so I think this awareness has increased, um, has been increasing over years. And it's not just that EU uh, grants now require us to you know, disseminate uh, what we learned in our research projects that um, are being funded, but also we want to tell people. Uh, and we also see this uh, in the classrooms, I think. Um, it's totally different um, view that students can get uh, if a researcher can tell them something uh, from their, their own experience uh, it might not be for business experience uh, working in a company, but um, experience that it's gained uh, through uh, working with companies on different projects. And they actually feel that uh, this adds to their competencies and preparedness uh, to enter the business world after they finish studies. And also, um, it's, I think, very important also to uh, in, try to influence very young people already from the kindergarten on. Uh, children uh, and then you know, primary and secondary school um, um, uh, students, because it, it will be there that will have to make progress in the future. And by bringing science to them in a very attractive, interesting way, I think uh, this increases the chances that they will, they will also uh, try to embark on this path, not necessarily in the academic uh, careers, but also in the companies. Um, so yeah, I think it's crucial. And uh, we, uh, so I, I feel this as a researcher, but also in a position um, uh, as a vice rector, I can see that there have been additional um, 
efforts made through in all our schools. We have 26 member schools uh, at the university and everybody from the technical field, the natural sciences, uh, humanities, even arts, they realize that this is getting more and more important and that we have to, you know, be heard, make ourselves heard, because we can influence then also the, the how the discourse in the society uh, as a whole is run. With all this, as you mentioned in the beginning, fake news and you know now uh, democratization uh, has um, enabled uh, that everybody has a voice, um, and we have to make ourselves heard as well. So thank you, Tanya. Um, so you were mentioning this, um, that the fact that we need to, I mean, we, the universities have the power to influence um, public policies, what's happening in society. And maybe uh, I would like to, to ask Julian, what, what is his view? Yeah, of course. Uh, my, my answer would be a little more general from the point of view of the relationship between researcher, uh, communication, and maybe and media. Uh, and uh, you told that uh, I think there is more, more and more near need for scientific communication uh, because information spaces are more and more important, especially online. Uh, and it can be difficult, uh, for example, for citizens to distinguish between uh, true and false. And I believe that it is one of the responsibilities of researchers to socialize their knowledge and researches. And I'm going to say something very banal, but uh, it's not really usual. It's important to give the floor to researchers. And uh, we see in the media, for example, in debates, uh, many experts, but uh, not necessarily researchers uh, or specialists. And it's, uh, it's a really big problem. Uh, we, we saw that uh, in the first year of the COVID, for example. And researchers must be able to express themselves in the media, which is not easy because it's not uh, our background. And, um, and there, is, there must be a dynamic of collaboration between communicators and researchers. Uh, we have different skills, but uh, common objectives. Uh, communicators can help researchers to better understand uh, the research and how we can express that to the students. And we, we, they can help us to understand the needs of the public. So I think there's a kind of initiative uh, that, that makes the relationship between the researchers and communicators are really, really important for, for the society and for the way we, we can uh, share our research. That's, um, thank you, Julian. Yes, I see uh, um, it, it's um, important how, how to make these two researchers, communicators uh, collaborate for this common goal. I think that, that that's what you said, that's, uh, that really, it's very important. And, and precisely because of this, perhaps I would like to go to Matthias now. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for a lot of interesting viewpoints on this. Uh, yeah, I can follow up on some stuff that you have been talking about already, but <clears throat> during my time at, uh, in, in the sector, I've witnessed, uh, I think probably the biggest change is uh, that the role of the researcher has changed or have changed into a lot of different roles. And I guess that uh, today, at least in Sweden, we have a lot of researchers that are doing like super great work on communication on their own, and being very skilled at, at, at being in the debate and, uh, and getting their results out to the public. Um, and uh, they have like, <laughs> I would say like a natural feeling for good communication. <clears throat> and then there's still uh, researchers more focused on just doing research. And my viewpoint is that I think uh, there has to be um, possibilities to have all kinds of roles in the systems. Uh, and that's kind of where my profession comes in, I think, because um, when there's uh, research results that has to be out there, uh, I guess that communication skills are needed and, and we can bridge some of the gaps. Um, but I would say, Right now, there's also a lot of uh, challenges for the communicator's profession. Uh, I think one challenge is that the, the, the profession in itself gets a lot broader by the time. So 
a lot of people hired at my university, for instance, has a very wide range of responsibilities. They're supposed to handle like web updates and uh, um, uh, press work, student recruitment and science communication. And I guess uh, it's very hard to, to become an expert in, just in science communication because uh, I think that's kind of a different field than uh, the others. Uh, and sometimes I can feel there's also a little bit of a lag uh, when it comes to science communication and, the, the, and my profession, because uh, I think we're still a little bit focused on, on, on traditional communication, like doing a lot of press releases, for instance, and we, we put a lot of resources into that. And I think, just to make some kind of point, I think, uh, yes, I think researchers have a lot to learn from, from uh, communicator and our skill sets, but I think that a lot of communicators have a lot to learn about good, uh, good, communicate, good science communicating researchers as well. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Matthias. That that's uh, that reminds me of what uh, Jane was mentioning earlier, that you really need to collaborate, and uh, and when you convince the, you have to convince your your partner, your the researcher, that uh, I mean, Jane, perhaps you can go deeper into your exp into your experience on yeah. On that. So um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, much of it is about um, demonstrating as you do when you kind of are marketing a product is demonstrating the benefits of the of the research communications to the researcher so uh, presenting it as if it's you know as something that they can benefit from so looking at it from the perspective of what's in it for me or why should I care why should I do this what's the the overall point because it could be con um, construed as just being additional work um, without any real kind of you know, results or, or consequences that are meaningful. So it's trying to explain that it's uh, invaluable in, in helping with raising the profile, increasing engagement, sparking new collaboration and new ideas with, um, with colleagues within the institution as well as beyond um, and, and reaching a wider audience to ultimately make the, the research relatable um, with particularly a public audience and get away from the uh, sort of misconstrued idea, I suppose, that universities don't really work in the public with, with the public interest at heart or that it's just a place for students. Um, there's not really any, you know, tangible benefits to the um, to, to the research. So it's trying to dispel those myths and, and hopefully show that the research does have an impact um, and that's ultimately what they want so it's not asking them to to do something and being prescriptive if you like it's more working with them to demonstrate the benefits and how you can support them as a support function rather than giving them tasks um, and I find that that's particularly useful um, you know as well to show the um, as I mentioned earlier the <coughs> the outputs that you've created for other uh, for researchers or other departments or the faculties or the projects. Um, so this is what I've done for them. This is the outcome and, and this is how it helped drive engagement. We can support you in a similar way with creating this sort of content, you know, about your fellowship, about your project, um, a case study or event, et cetera. So yes, it is really focusing on the benefit and, and not the features as such. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Jane. And uh, perhaps now I would like to ask Luisa, because Luisa has a, a, a training as a scientist, uh, and you also do uh, communication. So perhaps you can you, you combine two worlds? Yeah, yeah. Me, myself, I have combined it. Uh, but uh, now I actually uh, do some kind of research also, but in the field of science communication. So it's again, it's a combination of, of research communication. We have to apply our own ideas to the research we do. Um, 
So I think this tandem is, is great. I think they, many things have been said. So let me see how I add to this, this, this discussion. Um, I think the going back a little bit to the role of, of universities, you know, and the importance of universities. Um, I think um, they have a, a major uh, role and they can have a major impact in the trust that is put around science, you know? So it's not only about legitimizing research, but creating trust. So just to give you concrete ideas, um, we have recently finalized a project that was funded by the European Commission, which is called CONCISE. And in this project, we uh, kind of analyzed the influence that uh, science communication had on citizens' beliefs, opinions, and perceptions around science, in concrete around four topics, let's call them hot topics. Uh, so vaccines, for instance, uh, climate emergency, things like this, this kind of four hot topics. And so we organized big consultations um, for more than five or almost 500 citizens in five different countries. And then the idea was to ask them, okay, so how the means and the channels that we use in communicating sci science is impacting your beliefs, your perceptions, your trust. Um, and among many other things, what appeared was uh, that universities as, are seen as trustable bodies, you know, as objective bodies, so that people really are interested and trust the communication that is done by the universities. So it is perceived that the universities do not have a conflict of interests, so that the communication they are doing is transparent uh, and therefore is trustable. So I think this is a very important point also. And then regarding the kind of communication that we do, um, I think there is a responsibility as communicators and as institutions to provide good quality of this communication. You know? So from this same study, a couple of things or aspects emerge like uh, sensationalism or biases or contradictions you know, or politicization. All these aspects may affect the trust and, and, and the trans yeah, more, mostly the trust, but also the beliefs and, and the opinions that, that citizens have uh, regarding science. So I think um, that, yeah, universities are very important players uh, and that the communication that we do in, inside the, these institutions is, uh, does have an impact, you know. Um, therefore, I think it is important, it is very important to promote or to have institutional policies that establish that or that support the well establishment of, of the communication departments and of course the relationship between researchers and communicators as mediators for this trust building. So thank you Luisa and uh... what you say that um, it is important that the universities should have um, uh, policies like they, they should make decisions on okay, how do we, uh, in practice, uh, how do we motivate this? How do we uh, push for communication at an institutional level? And this brings us to another question that is, well, how do we ask researchers? How, oh, no, actually I want to say this, how do we reward researchers for doing outreach and communication? Um, because when, um, when, for example, when you see new uh, calls for, for positions for hiring, uh, you're always asked for, to, the, to the new hiring, you ask uh, excellent research, ex excellent teaching skills, um, um, good, uh, a good network of collaborators, uh, international impact, and, um, but you you never see outreach or or I mean as that or science communication, um, so and and perhaps you have more experience the communicators here that that work with researchers. Uh, how do you motivate the effort that the researchers put on that that is um, perhaps not um, that is perhaps taken from other activities that are evaluated, for example, for tenure. Uh, for tenure processes and uh, uh, I don't know, scientific evaluations, for example, Luisa, would you like to add? Yes, yes, I can start. I can start with the with the discussion around this. 
Um, of course, I think that the idea will, may, will be to make uh, structural changes, you know, so that the assessment, the protocol for assessment will include these outreach activities. Um, inside the evaluation system for researchers, I, as you mentioned, uh, this is not uh, one criteria in many cases, but there are cases in which it is, you know? So I, I think we can take these good practices and have them in mind um, and start following the path, you know? So not, not every country, not every context goes at the same pace and do not have the same interests, of course. But I would like to cite the, um, the evaluation protocol of uh, Dutch universities. And I'm sorry that there is no, no one representing the Netherlands because maybe they could uh, talk better about that. Um, but I know that they uh, published a protocol on new metrics for research assessment. Uh, I think it was uh, back in 2014. So I think it started around 2015 in which um, it's not only measure the scientific quality as, as we know it, but also the societal relevance of the research and also the viability of the research. So it kinds of inside the, the protocol for, for research assessment, they consider the future, you know, not only what has been done, but also what will be done and how the, this line of research and this group uh, is impacting society, you know, so outreach activities are included inside this. Um, as far as I know, uh, one of the limitations, if I may say, I don't know if it's a limitation or not, um, of this protocol is that it does not provide uh, concrete um, variables to measure, you know, so it gives kind of categories, but then it is uh, peers that, that make this assessment of how well are you. So it, it doesn't give indicators. I was missing the word, sorry. Uh, but I think this is a very good practice, you know, and there is an, uh, uh, an structural change that is now assessing researchers' involvement into these outreach activity, communication activities. But then what, is, what I find even more interesting of this protocol is that they assess research teams, not individuals. So this, go back, this goes back to what Matthias was saying. I mean, we have to allow the different personalities and the different skill sets, you know? So of course, one single person cannot do everything and one single person is not interested in doing everything. Uh, but so if we measure it as a group and then again, uh, promoting these tandems, uh, then it is very strong. Yeah, so I, I think this is a, it's a great uh, starting point to, to discuss on how we, yeah, we're, we're assessing and measuring this involvement with communication from, from researchers. Great, thank you, Luisa. That's, that's uh, good. It's good to know that uh, in, the Netherlands, in the Netherlands this is being done. Uh, perhaps Tanya, since uh, you work at the head of the university, um, you know, you can you can tell us what uh, what is happening yeah. in Ljubljana. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just about to put my hand up, so you uh, sense this wonderfully. Um, yes, thanks, Luisa. Very interesting uh, example. I think this also shows we know that uh, Dutch universities are very progressive uh, in many uh, research aspects and quite successful as well uh, on an international level. So uh, I think this is a, a great example. Um, I must say that um, at our university as a whole, uh, we don't have um, any criteria uh, when hiring uh, new people that would include uh, their outreach uh, capabilities, potential uh, or past uh, record. Uh, as Matthias was saying, um, I think this was a very uh, good observation. Some people are great, they are naturals, and these people are present uh, in, in all sorts of media, uh, in all sorts of platforms, um, and they are actually ambassadors, can be ambassadors of science. Uh, but there, I guess the majority of researchers uh, are not like this. So they like to be, let's say, left in peace um, doing their own thing in the labs or you know uh, the fields wherever um, and uh, i think that maybe we should start considering uh, also these issues more when recruiting uh, people or also um, 
we are uh, considering them at least partly at the University of Ljubljana already. I come, as I said, I'm a marketing professor. Uh, my uh, faculty, one of the 26 that I mentioned before, is a School of Economics and Business. And we uh, have obtained uh, all uh, major international accreditation labels. And we have started with this process years ago, like I think 20 years ago now. And for instance, in APIS accreditation, which is one of the accreditation labels for business schools, um, the most prominent one in Europe, one of the big three, let's say, uh, in a global context, uh, there is a chapter, a standard that uh, the school has to fulfill, which is called a contribution to society. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, when we started with this, you know, the criteria are, are evolving all the time. And now, for instance, at my school, when we have to produce the report for the reaccreditation, which is comes uh, every five years or even in the interim um, reports, we have to report all sorts of our engagement. The pro uh, as all professors have to report their engagement in the society. And this is something that becomes part of our job uh, obligation. So, you know, you have to teach, you have to do research, uh, and you also have to do, of course, administrative stuff at the school, but then also you have to engage in one way or another. And for now, uh, this is not a criterion uh, at the individual level uh, when we have this annual assessment, but it is uh, something that school measures at the school level. So. Are we doing well enough? Uh, are we progressing well enough? And then there is some, you know, there are policies um, made and uh, the measures implemented uh, that, you know, offer the incentives sometimes, um, or, you know, sometimes there's, you know, the talk, uh, pep talk, like we need to do this more. And it's uh, like Luisa uh, said, more at the level of um, uh, wider group, not individual, which I think it also makes a lot of sense because we can all contribute in different uh, ways. Some people are very good on television um, and they're, you know, uh, in the, uh, on the speed dial of many journalists because they, the journalists know that they will provide, um, um, their appearance will be well received uh, uh, and they always respond. And there are some people that do other things in the background and are also uh, quite important. Um, so uh, there are actually these two uh, levels uh, that we have to consider. And I'm sure this will you know, seep into the criteria for uh, employment or for employing people and also for you know, maintaining uh, jobs uh, more and more. And for instance, in Slovenia, we had uh, we have something that is called a habilitation process. So, in order to become a full professor, you know, uh, through the academic career, you have to go to the steps, uh, uh, stepping stones, from the you know uh, the uh, assistant professor, and then the associate, and then there is full professor. And there is evaluation uh, at each of these levels. And uh, in the past, so decades ago, there was a drive to produce English. Uh, publications, so the internationally recognized publications. And then like 10 years ago, the tide has started to reverse because they noticed that, uh, you know, because the, the criteria were rising, we all had to publish in the uh, international uh, high top tier journals. Uh, this was all done in English. So there were no Slovenian re uh, scientific publications any longer because there was you know, nothing for us as researchers. There was no incentive to do this. This is just a waste of time. Why should I try to publish in a Slovenian um, um, journal, you know, even if it is academic journal, because then I will not get cited because nobody will be able to read this you know, in the wider world where citations matter. And uh, also, you know, this is not something that counted uh, against this habilitation criteria. So, our Slovenian publications were gone. And that means that even, you know, people in business are even, you know, th there might not be the Slovenian uh, journals, may not be really uh, highly academic, but they could be in this interim, you know, this uh, world in between uh, popular and academic science, uh, so scientific level. And there were readers like in companies, they were reading this, you know, like uh, when I, somebody published a marketing journal, publication, so marketing article, there would be people in the company A or X 
that would be interested to read this. And suddenly there was nothing in Slovenian any longer. So they implemented uh, again the criteria, the habilitation criteria now says, okay, you have to publish something in Slovenian language as well. So I think this is also at the societal level, uh, at least uh, within the nation, an important element. Uh, of course, I come from the language uh, group uh, or language, our national language is spoken only with you know, a couple of million people. It's not the same for French or Spanish or English or everybody here, basically, even Italians you know, would be uh, uh, would, would go into this category. Um, but maybe Sweden is more uh, particular, also like uh, Slovenian. But yeah, this is also something that we need to pay more attention, I think, uh, in the, at the institutional level. Right, that, that is a good point. I mean, we're in, in this um, in this era where uh, we do everything globally. I mean, now we're all in different places. We're speaking in English because this is like the 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 language that we use to work with uh, international collaborators. But one also has to think of the local engagement. So what's happening with the, the local? Um, people and that outreach. So um, yes, that is a very, very important point. Um, so uh, perhaps we could go uh, now to Matthias. Uh, if you have any um, uh, opinion on how we, how can we reward researchers, motivate researchers to collaborate more in, in communication? Yeah, actually, we have a lot of discussions about this in the Swedish system right now, but I guess it's pretty much the same in all over Europe. But uh, I think... Is, uh, sorry, is there anything in particular that, that makes you discuss this issue at this time, at this moment in this? No, but I think it has been for a, for a lot of years. I, maybe the reason is that we... Uh, most Swedish universities are governmental uh, universities, publicly funded. And actually it's in the law for the universities that we should uh, engage in, in on information work and make sure that our uh, research results come, to, uh, come out to the public. <clears throat> um, but that's kind of, I, I don't know how, how I should put it, but we have a conflict with the reality because the, the funding system, of course, is based on research and education only. And that's the, uh, the two funding streams that exists to the universities. So I think it's very hard <clears throat> now to create uh, incentives for researchers that are not interested in, in engaging in, in outreach. Because... Um, I think we're pretty typical for, for universities in Sweden because like at the university level, we encourage uh, doing a lot of outreach work, but when it comes to the department level and the department heads trying to get the, the budgets together, it's very hard to, uh, to let researchers set time aside for doing outreach work because they're always tied up in, in education, research, and of course, a lot of administration nowadays. Uh, so I guess that's like the background why this has been discussed in Sweden. <clears throat> and personally, I'm not sure that it's the right way to go to, to make outreach activities uh, mandatory on an indiv 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 individual level. Um, uh, it, it's like, it's not a simple discussion. <laughs> and I think it's a lot of things that has to be taken into account. Uh, and especially that uh, it's very different how how interested and how talented you are in doing outreach activities. And I see a lot of research groups in my work where probably most of the researchers are uh, perfectly happy with doing their job in, the, in their labs or their environments. But maybe they have one or two people in the group that are super interested in, in outreach activities. So I think that was one of the things Luisa was uh, talking about, but I think if we should be build a system where we make outreach work uh, a part of the, the merit and recruitment system, I think we have to view it more on a group level and, and see the differences that need to exist to create great research and reach out with it. Um, maybe that's an easy may point to make. But, yeah. 
Yeah, if I may jump just with a sentence. Uh, also, when creating this kind of system, it is important to provide training because many of the skills that are needed to communicate are not just uh, for granted. So I think training is a very important aspect too. Right. Uh, and I guess in general, I mean, if we are uh, asking, I mean, if researchers, um, staff at the university are asked to do something, have to be uh, accompanied, they have to be helped in order to, to do this, because it also happens that maybe there are people that want to, but they don't just don't have the time or the, or, or the, the, the basic knowledge to, to do it in an efficient way. Um, so perhaps I, I, I want to go back to something that Matthias said that, uh, to, that it is different what happens at the university level and what happens at the department level. So these are two realities and the scope of their goals in a way they are they are different. Uh, perhaps Julian could tell us what his views on these are. How do you con how do you um, combine this this to what university what you expect as a university what what your head of department expects? Um, yeah, like maybe we can also say that uh, we have the institution, the institutional, the department level, and also the individual level. Because uh, from a very pragmatic point of view, uh, when you you sit in different councils, for example, uh, in France, the CNU, which gives uh, promotions or uh, helps uh, researchers with their careers, uh, we, we have to deal with your personal uh, evaluation and uh, the way that uh, this uh, dimension of communication is recognized by the institution and uh, how we we can how it can be uh, taken into account uh, by the institutions and um, i think uh, communication and dissemination uh, has to be integrated into the evaluation of careers by the institutions by the departments by but also by all the concept it's not only a question of uh, fundings or, or links with the uh, communication uh, staffs of the university. But um, I think uh, we have to, to encourage uh, researchers uh, to communicate, uh, not only with uh, saying that it's a good point, it's uh, good to do, but also to take that into account uh, with the way that we, we deal with that, these careers our uh, promotions, for example. It's very pragmatic, it's very basic, but I think uh, lots of colleagues uh, don't want to, to go with this kind of communication uh, because it's not the, the, the first focus of the evaluation of uh, research. Uh, you have uh, the paper on journals, you have the, the research projects, and uh, it's always at the end that you talk about uh, communication dissemination. So I think we will always we have to to take this uh, this issue and uh, and create the envy uh, or even the desire uh, for researchers to communicate uh, because they want to do and because they like it, but also because uh, it's it, it's really interesting for them for their careers and it's uh, it is part of the of the job. So it, it's not really. Uh, it's it's really pragmatic uh, and basic, but uh, as, as I discuss with lots of colleagues and uh, I see uh, lots of uh, um, uh, concils that examine uh, uh, um, researchers' promotions, uh, you always have this, uh, this this distinctions between what they do and what they want to do, and uh, they often do what is needed by the institution. So it's, it's uh, maybe a political problem, a more general uh, political problem of uh... um, so so you mean it's it's more a political problem on how will the university value how, how will it uh, value this uh, engagement, this uh, public outreach, or how do researchers um, think of their jobs? Um, uh, so you mentioned there is an individual level, yeah. like, is this part of our job? Is this part of my job to do this on top of everything else? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it can be, it, um, it can be if it is integrated in the process selection of a candidate and the, and the, the way uh, where, as you write, uh, for example, um, announcements of new, new jobs in university. 
you always have the, the teaching uh, elements, the research elements. But uh, for example, uh, today it's the beginning of the uh, recruitment process in France. Uh, you all you have all the the informations to to apply to different universities. Uh, I had a look this morning uh, at my uh, jobs in my system just to be curious, and uh, it's uh, just linked to uh, research and uh, and teaching. So if if you don't uh, put the, the elements of uh, valorization communication into uh, the recruitment process. You can't ask to the researchers, uh, they have to do that. So it's, uh, we have to maybe to change the mentality or uh, at least uh, just uh, give this information um, or, or maybe to teach to young researchers. For example, I have a, a class at the doctoral school that it's called uh, 2.0 PhD. Uh, Doctor on 2.0, and uh, when I, I teach to the to the young researchers to use uh, social networks, to use uh, YouTube channels, to use blogs, and things like that. So it's a it's a new way to uh, to to do their research. They do their PhD, but they can also write on the blog. They have to interact on the social media. They can do podcasts with a YouTube channel, and if they do that after the the PhD, uh, when they enter to the academy. Maybe they will be uh, well prepared to uh, to do the job uh, of communication. They don't have to do uh, ten hours of media training to be uh, trained to talk to a, to a journalist, for example. So it's uh, I think it's uh, you're right. It's a new way to do to do our job. It's not it's not a new job, but it's a new way to do uh, the job according to uh, the new ways to uh, to to access to information and to share information. So thank you, Julien. I think this is a this is a very nice idea of having this PhD 2.0. Perhaps we also need the notion of researcher 2.0 or university 2.0. That's that might be interesting. Uh, so I would like to ask the VUB team, what are what is your experience with uh, with this? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of valuable things have been said already, uh, definitely about, you know, also being careful with criteria for hiring, because it has a, a lasting impact on the output. I think Tanya has given a very good example of, of the language uh, discussion there, for instance. I also agree with what Matthias says about you, you can't expect research to, to be this one man show being good at communication and research and education and so forth. And I like the idea also what Louisa mentioned about the training, how that is interesting. And I think what I like to say about this is that we have to think broadly about what rewards mean, uh, the different shapes of rewards, because what we find in our experience is that there are a lot of researchers that are actually very enthusiastic about science communication, but it's very important to make them feel that they're not you know, reinventing the wheel, that they're not on their own doing it. So I think it's good to have projects that can help them and that there is assistance and there's guidance of how to do that. An example at our university is, for instance, the, the Children's uh, University, um, where uh, they get help in how to translate research topic to a workshop suitable for uh, children from a specific age, and they have rehearsal sessions and so forth. So it's good to have, you know, to make sure that the researcher is not alone in trying to, to get that goal of, of, of communication. Um, and another way that we try to see it as or promote it as a reward for the researchers to also uh, emphasize the benefit of the communication skills that you're developing, uh, where uh, it's not just important within academia, but it's also important if, if you're thinking of different career paths and it's not something that you take along with you. Um, I guess it means in the end that there's a lot of goodwill that you have to uh, count on, but I, I do think it's the reward is a, yeah, like a good balancing act between projects that are freely available and that can speak to a different type of researchers from introvert researcher to somebody who's really a, like a natural in communication, as well as saying, well, we have this guidance, we can help you with that. I think that's a, a yeah, I think that's a good way of looking at it. So thank you, Sarah. Um, I would like to ask uh, Sarah, uh, <laughs> Uh, what is your uh, experience uh, motivating, uh, or what do what do your researchers gain from from this? In your opinion? Yeah, well, I can uh, I can agree with what Sarah said. Um, 
And I think we're very lucky that at our university, we have a science outreach office. And our job specifically is to be a bridge between the scientists and the public. Um, and that's very valuable because it's something else to just take certain information and then um, mold it and then give it to the public, but we actually help them to do it themselves. Um, and that's, that's also good for the public because then they, they know that they get the information directly from the source. Um, so I think that's super valuable. Um, and as we talked about, you know, that, that reward, it can be the funding. I talked about it before in Belgium, it's starting, it's becoming a part of funding applications um, and not the underhand those communication skills. Um, if researchers have worked with us, they're likely to come back. So, you know, that must mean something. Um, they often talk about the fact that it's easier to explain their work even to colleagues in the field. And, and it helps them to, to put up collaborations and then broaden their network and stuff. So, yeah. And I can agree with a lot that has been said. You know, I think we have to find a balance between um, science outreach as a good and a valuable asset for an individual um, or something that is necessary to be able to do research. Um, yeah, as Matthias and Luisa have talked about, uh, not every researcher is good at it and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, and I know that we're far from the scenario where it's all about research, um, but I think we always have to be careful in the future, maybe not to let the balance tip too far in either direction. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so when we um, so we were discussing about uh, training, how do we help researchers to communicate, uh, to see the value in communication? I mean, we have seen that it's it is necessary. Um, now we discuss how we put value on it, and now um, concerning this, um, how do we make uh, communication more inclusive? Uh, going back to what Tanya was mentioning about the languages, and which I guess in, in uh, the, the countries where, um, the non-English speaking countries, um, how do we uh, deal with, okay, the, the local language or, or other minorities? I don't want to say Slovenian is a minority, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it, is, it is a matter of diversity of, of uh, how you do your communication. If you think of, okay, the local language. Um, uh, so how do you see this in, in these modern times? Julian was also talking about this PhD 2.0 using social media. Um, that, that also has a component of globalization. I mean, in social media, it's just one, one village, one big village. Um, so how do, you, how do you integrate the, the issue of, of inclusion in, in your work as either communicators, researchers doing both? Um, could you could you tell me, Sarah? Sarah? Uh. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can say a thing or two. Um, it's very difficult to to reach those minorities. Um, I think one of the reasons that it's so difficult is that we, we tend sometimes to group to group all of these different minorities and say let's make it inclusive for everyone, but that's that's simply impossible. It's very hard to achieve. Um, and I believe that a part of the solution to work towards it is to work very locally and very specific. Um, the example that I can give from my perspective is the Children's University. Um, I was very happy to hear Tanya talk about introducing uh, science and outreach early. Um, the Children's University is a concept where we help researchers to create a workshop for kids or uh, a lecture that is tailored to kids, so 10 to 12 year olds. And what we saw in Belgium when we wanted to start the Children's University of our own in Brussels is that there were already a lot of children's universities where um, parents can enroll their kids to participate. And what you see is that those kids and those parents are mostly white and mostly high educated themselves. Um, so we certainly in the diverse context of Brussels deliberately chose to work with schools and that way you shift the responsibility of enrolling a kid from those parents to the teachers. Um, and for sure, you're going to reach kids that otherwise would not have participated. 
I know simply because their parents might not have a higher education and are not on the lookout at all for those kinds of fancy projects. Um, and I'm really proud to say that now we, we do have a network here within the primary schools in Brussels and we're able to reach kids from all backgrounds. Um, but as you see, that's a super specific solution for a very specific group. Um, so more generally, I think we really have to try to find facilitators, the right facilitators, uh, organizations that already have links, already have experience and have a network with the community that you're trying to reach. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and in, in, the, in that direction, perhaps uh, I would like to ask Jane. Jane, what is your experience? Um, I mean, since you work with uh, dif researchers in different disciplines across departments, what is your uh, uh, experience, um, including this aspect of uh, inclusivity, of, of being diverse in the communication? Um, so I think language that we that we use needs to be inclusive in that it, it shouldn't be overtly academic, it should be relatable, it should be language that people are familiar with from all different socioeconomic backgrounds um, and not abstract and therefore alienating to the to the end user. So I think language in, in a lot of the communications, particularly web communications, can unfortunately, if kind of not kept in check, stray into that sphere of, of being quite jargon filled, um, quite abstract and ob obscure to a lot of uh, people, which obviously, unfortunately, perpetuates this, this perception that universities aren't there for the general public good and they don't really understand, relate to um, public concerns. So language is important and also the use of, um, of imagery to make sure that it is kind of reflective of that um, diverse audience. Um, so I think that it's, it's really kind of critical when you're using imagery not to show, especially if it's if it's aimed at a non-academic audience, to kind of so people can, can see themselves um, reflected in, in those images. So targeting communications at specific groups who may be marginalized or may not feel like universities play um, a seminal role in, in delivering public impact and they may not feel the same affinity to um, universities as other public sector in institutions. It's, it's really important that, you know, that comes across and it isn't in any way divisive or alienating um, of those groups that we're trying to reach. So yeah, it, um, imagery and language is, is some of the key things that, um, or two of the key things that I believe is really important for ensuring that. Uh, may I jump in the discussion? <laughs> just uh, yes, just because I mean this is a this is actually a topic that has uh, attracted my my attention and my interest a lot in the in the previous months. So I have been uh, actually checking a lot about this. Uh, what does it mean to be inclusive? You know, what what does it mean exclusion in science communication? And I came across um, a researcher, a professor at the University College London which is called Emily Dawson. And she has worked for more than a decade now about this idea of exclusion from what she calls everyday science learning, and uh, which is a, a, another terminology for science communication. Um, and she just, pub uh, yeah, she just published uh, a book very recently, uh, tackling exactly this, these aspects. Um, and in her book, one of the main things that I get from, from, this, from this work and from this analysis is that we have kind of in general misunderstood what exclusion means, you know? We have kind of blamed the, the minority groups for not being a part of the scientific uh, communication efforts, you know? So it's their fault that they are not interested in taking part. It's their fault that they are not coming to this, you know? And therefore, the activities that we do normally, or I mean, generally speaking, in the, 
following this idea, what they try to do is to persuade these minorities that, okay, this is something that really interests you. Come here. This is interesting. This will change your life or this will benefit you. I mean, not change your life, but yes, benefit you. Uh, and the way we're doing it is fantastic. So just come, you know? So of course, we're, we're trying to include the minorities without changing anything, you know, without having the, the same. So I think it's very important. And this, this ties in with, uh, with uh, the, the children university that Sarah was mentioning. So you had to change the strategy, you know. So we have to really identify what are the exclusion barriers, because they are, uh, and tackle them directly. So I think it's actually case specific and public specific. But there could be barriers on, I don't know, like wh what I will call, and, and Emil Dawson calls it also, infrastructural barriers. So locations where we do the, 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 the outreach or the communication activities. Um, pricings, if they are, they talk a lot about science museums. So of course, I mean, if you have to pay a fee to enter, then I mean, it's only some kind of people that can come. Uh, language, of course, it's, very important, but then also conceptual barriers, like is the top that I'm addressing, is it actually related to your life, you know, is it actually related to you? Anyhow, um, is the topic respectful with others' beliefs and knowledges, you know, uh, and is it actually accepting or living uh, place for any kind of discussion or debate, you know, or is it presented as something, this is it, you know, yeah, this sometimes happens with science, although the intrinsic characteristic of science is being, uh, you know, proof, error, proof, error, and uh, always reflective, but sometimes it is transmitted as this is the truth, you know, so these things are, I, 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 I really think are so inspiring and maybe a bit too philosophical, <laughs> you know, but uh, I think reflection helps us a lot into our practice because when we ask the correct questions, we can identify these barriers and work towards, you know, uh, yeah, just overcoming the barriers. So for instance, one, one good example will be to take communication activities to common places, you know, to the street. Let's take it out to the street. Let's not do it inside our universities because still the universities, you know, if, if I, I belong to a community that has never thought about going to the university or has no interest or you know, has no tradition in going to the university, then maybe the university is not a place that they will feel comfortable uh, going to. Yeah, so uh, I really recommend this 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 work because it's, it has been very inspiring. Yeah, when we talk about inclusion, exclusion in science communication. Can I jump in now to what try to what Luisa uh, just said? Um, I think that of course you're right. I mean, it's um, always a matter of. Uh, our policy, who do we want to reach, what do we imagine, uh, what is happening on their side. Uh, there is a question how to get even into the mainstream media sometimes, because you know, our topics might be too boring, they're not scandalous or, you know, not uh, in bringing a big uh, debate then uh, in the forums and so on. But uh, my experience from, I mean, this um, pandemic situation that we uh, uh, ended up uh, with, uh, I think in a strange way, it has been an equalizer because I think we, we are all sitting at home now. It's not important how well you are dressed, uh, how far something is because it's at the tip of your you know, uh, fingers. And also you don't have to show yourself. You can be in you know, this Zoom uh, black box anonymity. You, know, you just switch off everything and just listen. And um, uh, recently in November, we had this uh, European Night of Researchers, uh, which you all, I guess, uh, know. This is a European initiative. And this is actually bringing you know, science out to the streets. And it has been going on for years. And it happened to me that, I mean, I was always interested in other, of course, disciplines than my own. So I went to an, an event or two. And more I could not manage because you know, they were dispersed uh, around the city. And now this year, I was just sitting at home cooking and had my computer on. And I think I visited like 15 events. And I was amazed at what audience it was there. 
so, you know, it's not just people from academia that would go and listen to the colleague from other discipline talking, but there were, you know, from children to the grandparents, everybody, and it was really easy um, to, for them to engage. Um, and uh, I was especially, you know, astounded when I saw, I, I tuned in in one of the cosmos, uh, uh, so astro astronomy topic, because this is something which I think is fun. And I was shocked when I logged on, there were like three screens in, in Zoom of children, you know, eager, waiting to, you know, like now we will, you know, participate and talk with researchers. And then they had all cameras on, of course. Um, and they actually engaged. And I was thinking, well, this is, you know, the way it would never happen live. It, it was done in the street. So maybe we should be using this medium more. Although we are now, I guess, most of us are sick and tired of, you know, being behind the screens, but there can be some fun events and it, there are more, um, the, the access is much easier for many, many people. And although it's still true that people from more affluent, uh, high uh, education background families are, uh, let's say, more uh, prone to attend or they have more possibilities. But now, for instance, in Slovenia, we had this homeschooling now for four months. So all children had to get some sort of equipment, which means that in every household, there is something, uh, the way how, how they can actually attend these online uh, things. And uh, we should maybe just communicate more and prepare these events uh, for wider audience. Uh, and that, that would create one step to ignite a spark, at least an interest uh, in many of these groups that otherwise would never show up at the university seminar, let's say. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, yes, I mean, you, you, you point out something that is happening now. And that with uh, this, uh, these platforms being at home, um, you, you have removed a, a parameter, you have removed the, the, the physical place of the university. Um, and um, I, I honestly, I, I think it's interesting to ask if, if really is, is this um, breaking one barrier to, to, to reach people. And perhaps I would like to ask Julian, what is his view? I mean, we, we mentioned uh, Zoom, um, social media. Um, perhaps you can, you can tell us what is your view on this inclusion uh, issue. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I, I can talk about my example because that's the one I know. Um, for example, I, 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 um, I, I, I talked about the blogs, for example. Um, I write for the Fixed Post for 10 years or for the conversation for five years. So I think that these uh, new platforms, new spaces of information are really interesting for researchers to, to socialize their, their, their work. Um, um, I also believe that digital tools are very suitable. I, I talked about the YouTube channel, for example. Uh, I think this conference will be put on the, on the YouTube channel of Utopia. Uh, social networks. Um, I, I, also, I also think that the, the, produ the productions, the scientific productions can be uh, digital platforms, um, not only, uh, for example, scientific papers. Uh, if I talk about my, my discipline, discourse and uh, political discourse analysis, uh, I build with, with my colleagues uh, two different platforms uh, um, uh, linked on uh, um, Two platforms linked to the online analysis of electoral discourse uh, for the two pre previous uh, elections. And these platforms allow the citizens to uh, use the tools we developed and to check uh, what they want to discover into political discourse. For example, if they want to, to see what is the uh, discourse of Emmanuel Macron and compare with uh, Marine Le Pen and to uh, count the world uh, France, the world immigration, etc., they can do that. And um, it's maybe for five or six years we, we do this kind of uh, project because we, we, we think there is a gap between uh, the work we're doing about uh, political discourse analysis. We want to help citizens to understand the elections, but all the results of the, our analysis are after the election. So it's very really hard to help uh, the decision and to help the citizens to understand uh, well the, the different uh, issues of uh, presidential election, for example. 
that, that's, uh, that's a new way to, to do research for that. It's not just only uh, publish papers or uh, do conferences according to the, the subject we chose, but we also uh, want to, to develop real-time platforms uh, to, to be really useful. Uh, and uh, in, in CY, it's, it's more easy maybe than uh, uh, other places because we are a multidisciplinary uh, university. And so we can uh, combine uh, computer scientists and uh, mathematicians, for example, linguists, uh, communicate, researchers in communication or in media analysis. And I think it's, it's uh, maybe a new way to do, uh, to do research, uh, at the same time to combine uh, different skills from different uh, researchers and also to produce uh, new kinds of, uh, of research products, not only uh, conferences or papers, but also web platforms. Um, you can easily find that online. And uh, we, we have but, uh, one, uh, one thing which is really hard for us is to, to be able to communicate well and uh, to be uh, more efficient than uh, other media or uh, other institutions that develop that kind of platforms that are not really uh, as good as ours from a scientific point of view, but uh, which design and the communication is sometimes better than, uh, than ours. So it's, um, it's a great challenge to, to be able to, uh, to be in the, in the first place for the citizen and to help them to understand when you, when you are in a confront, uh, Right. When, you, when you hear lots of uh, discourse, political discourse, how you can uh, combine the different analysis. Thank you, Julian. And uh, also, also staying with this, uh, with the inclusion topic on, on, on social media, I wanted to ask Matthias, uh, you have a lot of experience uh, in, in these tools. How, how do you integrate this aspect? in your work with the researchers? Yeah. I think this question needs to be, uh, we need to be very humble <laughs> when we speak about this because it's a very challenging question, I would say. And actually it's uh, it's probably the most challenging challenging question in, in all kinds of communication work. And I think uh, very good things has been said here. Uh, I really want to like point out that uh, <clears throat> probably the most important thing to do when it comes to all kinds of communication uh, when we talk about inclusion is is the part of challenging ourselves <clears throat> uh, and and in in every communication activity try not to base our our work on on our own preconceptions and norms about people and uh, not uh, presuppose a certain type of life stories or or lives <laughs> Uh, at, at the ones that we try to target that that's like the most important thing but one this is I, I don't know if I have a lot of solutions but one thing I I, I want to to uh, emphasize is I think it was the Brussels team that talked about this in the in the start that it, it's very important to always remember that communication should be understood as a conversation <clears throat> and a dialogue. Uh, sometimes I, it feels like uh, communication is viewed upon as just talking, but, but it's very important, and especially when we talk about inclusion, to think of communication as both talking and listening and trying to make a conversation uh, taking place. Uh, <clears throat> and I guess that in, in some ways, social media can, can help us and new channels can help us a lot. But I think that we as institutions need to be a lot clearer about how we were using <laughs> these kinds of channels, because you know, not just to be negative, but I have, I think there's a problem when bigger organizations try to use new media <clears throat> that they tend to cling to them like if they were traditional media. They use uh, Twitter and Facebook like megaphones, and they use YouTube as if, as it, as its uh, medium for broadcast TV or something. So I think we need to be a lot braver when it comes to listening in all different kinds of uh, channels. Um, so that's my <laughs> view on this. That that is a very concise and very interesting. 
but uh, we really need to. Um, I mean, would you say that we need to uh, communicators need to educate the universities on how people use or people how they use these uh, new platforms? Well, actually, I think a lot of researchers and academic staff are better at using <laughs> social media in a in a inclusive way than we uh, as communic communicators sometimes. So I think we need to be very humble on how we use it. And maybe we need to educate ourselves a lot too um, about this. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. So, um, okay, so this has been really very, very interesting to see all uh, your, your views on these different topics. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, and uh, I wish there will be other uh, opportunities for us to meet and to keep discussing about this because there are, as we saw, there were very delicate questions. There are some directions of uh, many good ideas I've heard here. So I would really love to uh, continue talking to you uh, about this. Uh, but in the meantime, well, we're going to stop here. And I would like to thank you all for your participation today. Um, uh, thank you for sharing your views. Thank you for your generosity and for your time. And I hope that we will meet again. And in the meantime, well, good luck with everything. And um, now we're gonna we're gonna stop the streaming. So, bye, bye everyone.